Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of John, chapter 14, verses 11 and 12. And I'm reading from the New King James Version. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do, because I go to my Father. Thank you. Good morning! Oh, it was already working. Sorry again. Man, I'm going to quit yelling at y'all one day when I can't talk. Um, let's be fair. I like honesty. We are in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 this morning. Last week we were in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Don't ask me how that one worked. It just kind of fits better. No, the real reason is there's a line in 1 Corinthians 13 that has been used to discredit 1 Corinthians chapter 12. So we did them in reverse. The line is, when I was a child, I spoke as a child, that which is perfect has come, that which is in part will be done away. For we know in part, we prophesy in part. And that which is perfect has come. Um, when now we see dimly, then we will see face to face. That is used to discredit pretty much everything that 1 Corinthians 12 says, but I have a magic test that will tell you it's in verse 3. We're going to try it and see if it actually works. The Bible says it, so it works, right? Amen? Okay, let's see if it works. No one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. So we're going to try it. Three little words. We're going to see if we can say it. It's going to go, Jesus is Lord. I know we went to count to one. We're counting to three. You don't need your shoes yet. Right? Three words, right? One, two, three. One, two, three. Jesus is Lord. No one can say that except by the Holy Spirit. So the second we discredit the power of the Holy Spirit, we discredit our ability to say something as simple as Jesus is Lord. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, starting in verse 1. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to the mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I make known to you that no one, speaking by the Spirit of God, says Jesus is accursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. We have a problem when we give ourselves credit. One, we have a lot of weaknesses. Second, we forget an opportunity to praise God. First Corinthians chapter 12 is all about the Holy Spirit. And he lists the different ways in which the Holy Spirit works. And we talk about how the Holy Spirit empowers. And the problem is... This can become a difficult passage because of one line in 13 that people think that which is perfect that we see face to face was the Bible. If I look at the Bible and see a face, that's not actually a Bible, that's someone's face. And I don't mean that haphazardly. I mean, let's be very careful to say what the Holy Spirit can and cannot do. Because something as simple as saying Jesus is Lord is only through the power of the Holy Spirit. Something as simple as teaching God's Word is a gift of the Holy Spirit. Something like leading the church is a gift of the Holy Spirit. And all of these should be reflected in such a way that we say, it is God working through us to achieve His greatness. And not that we are anything more than the vessel that God uses. But he goes in great detail. Verse 4 through 11. He's going to talk about the ways that God gives us gifts that we then use for him. 
Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of ministries and the same Lord. There are varieties of effects, but the same God who works all things in all persons. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit. To another, the word of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by one Spirit. And to another, the effective of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the distinguishing of spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. And to another, interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things. Distributing to each one individually, just as he wills. These are the, this is the list that's a little more controversial. We don't get so up when he talks about administration or teachers or apostles or certain gifts we're okay with the Spirit doing and certain things we're not. Problem with this is the simplest prophecy y'all have all committed this morning. You committed the simplest prophecy that you need to commit every day. Confess Jesus as Lord. That prophecy in which we are so wicked that we cannot say it, but yet there is one spirit, one spirit, the spirit. Over and over we see this, and the emphasis is this. We have gifts. They're the spirit. We have gifts. It is the spirit working. And no one chooses their gifts. God designed them. And that one spirit works through us. And too often we're tempted to say which gifts are, you know, too miraculous and aren't miraculous enough. So I saw a baptism. Have y'all ever seen a baptism? Did y'all really think that water or taking a bath made you holy? Or did you think that God did something miraculous in the middle of somebody getting washed with water? Because otherwise, most people take baths, I hope. Mm -hmm. Not where I'm from, but here they do, right? And too often we will speak of what God is allowed to do and we will say, fit in our box like we've told you to. And we forget who we're talking to. And we forget that God is able to do all these mighty works. And it is only through him. And it is to his glory. And it is all for the oneness. He says, for the common good, the one spirit. This joining together so that all things work together. And that we all use what we've been given and not afraid of what the Holy Spirit can do through us. Because if one of us suffers, we all suffer. If one of us is exalted, we are all exalted. And if one of us is afraid of what the Holy Spirit can do through us, we lose out on what you're doing. We lose out on that gift that you have. That the Spirit has given to you and you've hidden in the ground. We know the story of the talents. And the one who hid the talent that God gave him in the ground. And this we speak of gifts. And do we hide that gift in the ground? And say, well, God, I know you've given me that. I'm not going to use it. You'll get it back. Instead of him getting back tenfold, a hundredfold, he gets back his gift. Verse 12, he talks about how this all works together. For even as the body is one, yet as many members... And all the members of the body, though there are many, are one body. So also is Christ. For by one spirit we are all baptized into one body. Whether Jew or Greeks, whether slaves or free, we were all made to drink of one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot says, because I'm not a hand, I'm not a part of the body. It is not for this reason any less a part of the body. And if the ear says, because I'm not an eye, I'm not part of the body, it is not for this reason any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, 
where would the hearing be? If the whole were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But now God has placed the members, each one as them, in the body just as he desired. I want you to look at this just a second. There's a phrase in here that we've twisted and we've said just because a hand is not a foot, it's not part of the body. That's not actually what it says. It says, if the foot says, because I'm not a hand, I am not a part of the body, it is not for this reason any less a part of the body. The second that you think that you are not enough, you are no less a part of the body. The second you say, I can't do what he can do, you don't become less of the body. When you compare yourselves to others and say you can't, it's not like you're separated. It's not as though you don't contribute. You will always contribute to the body. No matter what you're doing, you're contributing to the body. If you are sharing with the body and building it up, you're contributing to the body. If you're withholding good, you're withholding your trust in God, still contributing to the body. It is not as though you say, well, I'm not an elder. That's an easy one. I'm not an elder. I don't you know, need to do that. That's it. I blame that on elders. So, since I'm not an elder, you know, I, I'm, I'm not really a part of the body. It doesn't matter as much what I do. And it is not for that reason of me saying I'm not an elder that I'm any less a part of the body. He says, it is not for this reason. Just because we can look at others and discredit ourselves until we have this concept that the way that the Holy Spirit works through us is inferior to somebody else. We don't get instantly removed from the body. There, there isn't instant surgery. I've got a hangnail. Boom, gone. Wouldn't that be beautiful, though? I got a sword, fixed. Now they got laser, so it's pretty close, but still takes a little bit. Think about it. It is not the way it works in the body. When, when you are doing nothing, you are just as much a part of the body. Even though you have a gift that could be doing great things in the body, you're looking at something else and going, well, I'm not one of those. I'm just a little foot, I'm not a hand. I don't know how many of us want to give up our feet, though. Just so we could have an extra hand. I, I like having two hands and two feet. And too often we forget that you have been given the same Holy Spirit as everyone else. And for you to look at another person and say, I'm not that. And I don't care what that is. You're hurting the body. You don't move from the body. You hurt the body. Because they miss out on you. They miss out on you being the vessel that God uses to put his Holy Spirit into our presence. For him to be experienced. He goes on to this in verse 19. If they were all one member. If all you had was hands. No mouth, no eyes, no ears, no feet. If everybody was hands, I got it, okay. 19, if they were all one member, where would the body be? But now there are many members but one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Or again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, it is much truer that the members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. And those members of the body which we deem less honorable, on those we bestow more abundant honor. And our less presentable members become more, much more presentable. Whereas our more present able members have no need of it. But God has so composed the body. God has so composed the body, giving more abundant honor to that member which lacks. So that there be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, 
all the members suffer. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. We are only one body. We only have one spirit. And too often we neglect what God wants to do through us. This week somebody came in and told me a beautiful story about someone who prayed with them. They came in here, they found a door, and nobody caught them until they were in here. And then the secretary, we won't name her because that would be bad. Then you know who it was. See? And they came in and sat down, and the secretary, whoever it was, came in here. And this lady remembers that she prayed with her. I asked the secretary. She doesn't even remember doing this. But that lady said that it meant so much. She was actually said she was baptized here. And she told me how great God and how great God was working in her life and doing so many things. And the secretary didn't even remember doing it. And too often we think that those things which are more in the front are more important. And most of the time what God is saying is that which is in the back, that which is two people sitting here praying is just as great as anything done in public. W Wayne gets up here and presents communion, and, and that's, that's a focus, and it's great, and it's where we give our attention. But it makes it no less important when you're just praying with someone who's hurting, just you and them. Because if everybody got up here and did what Wayne did, wouldn't that just be confusing? Okay, your turn, your turn, your turn, your turn. We get in a train. I think that's dancing. Sorry, I, I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> we get in a train and we come up here and, you know, we present uh, the communion, the communion. And that's how we almost treat life. As though we want everybody to be the same. And I can't, I'm not a hand. I'm not an eye. I'm not an ear. I can't do what they do. I haven't been given this gift. And that's not how God designed it. God didn't go, I gave you this gift. Don't use it because it's not as good as that other one. And are we great enough to challenge God and say, God, you've designed things a certain way. I don't like it. Ouch. Verse 27. Not only are we one body, but we are Christ's body. Now you are Christ's body. And individually, individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, administration, various kinds of tongues. All are not apostles, are they? All are not prophets, are they? All are not teachers, are they? All are not workers of miracles, are they? All do not have the gifts of healing, do they? All do not speak in tongues, do they? All do not interpret, do they? But earnestly desire the greater gifts, and I show you a still more excellent way. Love. We are individually members of Christ. It is not a matter of being a part of something that is the body of Christ, but we are individually members of Christ. And this is where we take it back to a personal level and we ask the question, are you a member of Christ? Do you belong to Christ? Because belonging to a group that belongs to Christ doesn't work. It's a matter of being personally connected to him. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 and 13. For even as the body is one and yet has many members, and all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slave or free, and we were all made to drink of one Spirit. Today we ask that question, have you been cleansed? 
where water is the symbol and the Holy Spirit is working through it. And where you become part of the body and that you can individually say that I belong to Christ. I have the guarantee of the Holy Spirit. And that guarantee says, when I get to heaven, I've got my past. I've got that Holy Spirit. And knowing that all that he asks of us is that we believe him. We believe that Jesus is Lord. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, we confess Jesus is Lord. We repent of our sins, understanding that it is his cleansing that we want. We are buried with Christ in baptism in which we are given the guarantee of the Holy Spirit. That promise that says, when you get to heaven, you're in. And that Holy Spirit that stays with us in a faithful life. If we continue in him. If there's anybody who has never united with Christ and you don't have that guarantee, you don't have that cleansing. Or if there's anybody who needs prayers or wishes to submit to the eldership here, we ask that you come now as we stand and as we sing.